All right, guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about governmental power and individual rights. Federalist versus anti-federalist. Let's do it. All right, so this topic is really a showdown between two groups, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. Fun fact, do you know the Anti-Federalists didn't really call themselves Anti-Federalists? Actually, both groups called themselves Federalists. They were arguing over the true meaning of federalism, how exactly power should be divided up between the national government and the states. But since the winners write history, we gotta call them the Anti-Federalists, I guess. All right, so besides losing the name that they wanted, what else do we need to know about anti-federalists? And you don't actually need to know that, really. Well, they opposed the U.S. Constitution because they felt that it created a central government that was far too strong. They preferred that power be held at the state level. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states were sovereign and they wanted to keep it that way. So what exactly were they so afraid of when it comes to a stronger central government? Did their arguments have some merit? Well, they were afraid that the central government would restrict personal liberty and freedoms. They thought the national government would trample on states' rights and overtake jobs that formerly had belonged to the states. They believed that the national government would tax too highly its citizens. They also believed the U.S. Supreme Court, which didn't exist under the Articles, was going to overrule state courts, again diminishing state power and influence. And lastly, they were worried that the president was going to have a large standing army. That means that there would always be an army, so not just a wartime army, but that there would even be armies in peacetime, and they felt that this too would lead to a destruction of liberty. Well, it turns out that they kind of had some good points. The president does preside over a peacetime army. Congress does have the power to tax. The Supreme Court does overrule state government sometimes. So these are different things that... They kind of had some good points. One of the things they demanded in exchange for their support, or for at least not opposing, was they demanded that there must be a Bill of Rights to limit that national government. We'll talk more about that later. Two things that the Anti-Federalists wanted that they weren't as successful with were they wanted more explicit limits on federal power, and this didn't happen. They also wanted to eliminate the power of Congress to tax, and, well, anybody who has a job knows Congress can tax you. So that didn't work out either. But they did get the Bill of Rights that they saw at the very least. One of your acquired documents is that of Brutus No. 1. And this is written by a prominent anti-federalist. And he makes the case of why exactly this new national government under the Constitution would be so disastrous. In the essay, he highlighted the benefits of having small, decentralized republics where people have more local control over policies. And he warned that there would be a disastrous loss of liberty and freedom under this new central government. By the way, Brutus No. 1 and Federalist No. 10, those are both required documents. We're about to talk about Federalist No. 10, but to get all the information you need for both of those documents, make sure to check out the videos for Brutus and for Federalist No. 10. Get you everything you need to know step by step through those documents. It'll be like you read it. So speaking of Federalist No. 10, there was that other group, the Federalists. These were the people who favored and supported the new U.S. Constitution. They felt that having a stronger central government was necessary, that the Articles of Confederation had completely failed, that the government was too weak to respond to rebellions and to threats, and so we needed a stronger central government. James Madison wrote Federalist No. 10, which lays out one of our best defenses of why having this new, stronger central government would be so necessary. In Federalist No. 10, James Madison argues that a large republic is the best way to control factions or different groups that could actually threaten to harm the new nation. He goes on to also argue that the best thing that we need to do is to delegate authority to elected representatives at the national level and that in fact this will protect minority rights better than would be the case if we had these small republics. And lastly, he argues that we need to disperse power between both the states, but also a national government and have this balance of power to maintain that neither side gets too strong. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Anti-Federalists demanded that there be a Bill of Rights. And in this, they were victorious. So eventually there was a Bill of Rights. This refers to the first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution. 
These are guarantees of personal individual liberties and freedoms, things that the US government cannot take away from you. So one important thing to keep in mind is that the Bill of Rights isn't so much a guarantee of your freedoms as much as it really is a restriction on federal power, saying that they can't take away things like your freedom of speech, your freedom of assembly, your freedom of religion, your right to bear arms. They can't search you unreasonably. If they arrest you, they have to give you a trial by jury. They can't punish you in a cruel and unusual manner. All of these things are actually restrictions against the federal government. All right, guys, that's it. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. All right, guys, thanks again for watching this video. I really hope that it helped. If it did, please hit that like button for me. I appreciate it so much. Subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you guys next time.